to the Zen Brain Podcast, where we explore alternatives to psychiatric medication and strategies for conscious lifestyle change. Here's your host and philosophical entertainer, Michael Pierce. Michael Pierce. Welcome back to the Zen Brain Podcast. This is Michael Pierce. And in this podcast, we are going to be talking about the glycemic index and some strategies for weight loss. If you're looking to make some New Year's resolutions, uh, you can use this as your guide. Um, my advice on, on any goal or um, target that you're looking at achieving is make sure that you have metrics that you can measure. There's something about the mind looking at numbers and having a need to improve it. Yeah, because, for example, if you're if you're at the gym, like I get on the elliptical because I like to warm up my arms and my legs, and I'm watching the resistance number, and I notice each day I want to bump it up just another one just to see if I can if it feels any harder. And I realize pretty soon if I keep doing this, pretty soon, I'm going to be at like 25 resistance for 10 minutes and it's going to be more than just a warm-up it'll be a workout and that was kind of a, an epiphany for me as far as realizing how that works so I think a really good strategy with weight loss is measure and continue to measure and track it's almost like you don't even need to make a goal to increase too much just don't go backwards just steady steady improve so for example if you're on the elliptical and you're measuring your weight you're measuring calories that would be another number for me I just go 10 minutes if I was um, making a weight loss goal I would I would be running until my calories hit a certain point and I'd be taking that into account with what foods I was eating on the glycemic index as far as how quickly they burn and I would measure the resistance on the elliptical and just write that down every day. And then the only goal, the only task that needs to be accomplished is 10 minutes on the elliptical and track it. That's it. And naturally, you're going to want to go longer. You want to increase resistance. You want to burn more calories and ultimately get closer to your goal faster. So that's my advice. Um, I've got Susan here to go through each chapter of this um, glycemic index weight loss strategy. I hope you enjoy it and happy new year. Introduction, how to use this ebook wisely. They say confession is good for the soul. It's about to be good for your body as well. So tell the truth. How did you really do on your last diet? I'm betting it wasn't a great success. How do I know that? Just look at the book you're reading right now. I'm going to clue you in on a secret. You didn't fail on your last diet. Oh no, your diet failed you. That's right. And I'm not just making an excuse for you. Did you know that 95% of the diets on the market today fail? So if you're just coming off that bad relationship with your last diet, you're not alone. The road to weight loss is filled with broken dreams and untold pounds gained in futile attempts to lose a few. Yes, that seems to be the other side effect these diets have on us. Oh, there's that honeymoon period where it looks as if we're going to lose weight and keep it off. But then suddenly the honeymoon is over. We reach that dreaded plateau where no more weight comes off and then BAM! Not only can't we lose any more weight, but we actually gain weight. It's bad enough that we gain back everything we lost, but then, inevitably, we also gain a few more pounds along with it. Yes, the dreaded yo-yo effect. You're overweight. You lose some, then gain back even more. Who among us hasn't been there? Several times over. The fact that so many of us have this problem vividly illustrates that this occurs through no fault of your own. Facing a growing epidemic. By now, you're probably familiar with the problem. We are in the grips of an epidemic that threatens the very health of not only you and me personally, but that of the next generation as well. It's called obesity. Unbelievably, over 60% of the U.S. population is overweight. That's more than half of us. Nearly 25% of us are obese, or more than 10% over our ideal weight. 
That's one person out of every four. We have the dubious distinction of being the heaviest nation on earth. The sad news is that several other nations are fast on our heels. Ranking second behind us is the United Kingdom. About 58% of their citizens are overweight and nearly 20% are obese. But the weight is only an outward symptom. Our weight problem is in turn creating serious health problems as well, not the least of which is type 2 diabetes. At one time, confined to the 60 and over crowd, this form of insulin resistance is now being routinely seen in school children as young as 8 or 9. What gives with this? If you believe that there's nothing that can be done about the nation's weight problem, and yours in particular, think again. Because what I'm about to present will turn everything you thought you knew about weight loss on its ear. In fact, if you've been searching for a sensible approach to dieting, an approach that will last for a lifetime and not just get you into that smaller size for your high school reunion or your wedding or your daughter's graduation, then I've got great news for you. Could this really be a permanent weight loss plan? More than that, I've got a great weight loss management system for you. I'm not even going to call it a diet. A diet implies you follow rules for a certain period of time, then go back to your regular eating patterns, keeping your fingers crossed that you'll not gain the weight back but a weight loss management system works for you now and in the future. By learning about the special way of classifying foods, you can begin to lose your weight right now. But more than that, you can keep it off for the rest of your life. And in the process, you can also improve your health and your odds of living a long and healthy life, free from the fear of developing diabetes, heart disease, arthritis, and a whole host of generative diseases that are associated with the aging process. The system I'm introducing to you today is called the Glycemic Index. It's been called the missing link in the dieting dilemma. The glycemic index rates foods according to how quickly your body converts the carbohydrates of the foods into glucose. Originally developed for those individuals suffering from type 2 diabetes, it became obviously clear that it could help the rest of us as well. And that's good news. Why should we wait until our eating habits and sedentary lifestyle condemn us to developing diabetes before we make healthy changes? As a person desiring to lose weight, you want to choose foods that are low on the glycemic index, those that promote a slow, moderate rise in your blood sugar or glucose and insulin levels following your meals. This will help keep your hunger at bay. You'll feel fuller longer, but more than that, the slower the conversion, the more efficient your body is at dissolving fat and converting it into energy. Sounds like a win-win situation. By contrast, Foods that rate high in the glycemic index cause your insulin levels to spike rapidly following meals. This in turn also causes them to crash rapidly several hours later. Not only are you hungry, but you're tired as well. Who isn't familiar with that 3 p.m. sugar crash? This wild roller coaster ride of insulin contributes eventually to insulin resistance, which is only a few steps away from full-blown diabetes. But we'll talk about all of that in more detail as we delve into the book. How to use this ebook wisely. I can see it in your eyes. You already have the mouse in hand or that finger on your touchpad ready to check out the foods because you know we've included a few to get you started on your quest. That's good. I appreciate enthusiasm like that. But before you jump further ahead in the book, you might consider reading the entire volume through first. Get a feel for what the glycemic index really is. Develop a good understanding of how it can help you overcome your battle with weight gain. Learn how it can even help your overall health. Then keep reading, because we've provided you with even more information about not only those carbohydrates that we love to hate, but also about the vital role proteins play in your diet. But keep reading, even after that. We're throwing you a curveball here. We're even going to tell you about the secret life of good fats. If you haven't heard about these, you'd be astounded to learn just how invaluable these essential fatty acids are in what is soon to become your new eating lifestyle. And yes, as you may have already guessed, those EFAs, as so many call them these days, can also add quality years to your life. Once you read through all of that, we don't just drop you off at the corner and hope you can find your way around. No, we'll provide you with a variety of different foods, enough foods in fact to help you with every meal, showing you exactly which foods are best for you, and which not only promote weight gain and contribute to increasing your risk of developing age-related diseases. Pardon me, but I need to make one more point about health. I understand that you're expecting, and indeed receiving, a book that guides you along a weight loss program, but I still must add one more point about the role of health and the glycemic index. In this regard, this book talks briefly about a little-known syndrome called Metabolic X Syndrome. While it may sound like the title of a grade B science fiction movie, Metabolic X Syndrome is indeed a serious health condition. I need to emphasize here that it is not a disease or a disorder in and of itself. 
Rather, it is a set of circumstances that your body possesses that may raise your risk of developing diabetes. It is, in effect, a precursor to type 2 diabetes. If you possess these series of circumstances, there's a fair chance that you may develop a full-blown case of diabetes. Consider metabolic X syndrome your sneak preview into future possible health problems. If you discover, after reading this book, you may actually be one of the literally millions who do possess these conditions, don't panic and definitely don't give up, because now, armed with the information in this book, you have the remarkable opportunity to change the direction of your health. Just as with any good mystery, you'll be tempted to skip to the last page of this book to find out who done it. Only in this case, you'll be tempted to find out how to do it. And if that's how you want to begin, then start. But be sure to return to the pages between the back and these because there's a wealth of information on a new lifestyle and a new way of eating that will produce energy, health, and a new, more energetic you. You want to learn everything possible to not only attain that new body you've been dreaming of, but keeping it thin and outrageously healthy. Okay, now you can turn to the back of the book or chapter one. Just be sure to seriously study the glycemic index and how it can be your most trusted friend and guide you on a path to a new body, vibrant health, and unlimited energy. Chapter 1. The Basics of Smart Eating – The Glycemic Index Thanks to the most recent scientific research, the glycemic index has revolutionized the way Americans view their diets, and it could become your best friend in any attempt to help you lose weight. But more than that, by learning about the glycemic index you may also discover untold benefits in your health, including reducing your risk of developing metabolic syndrome X, a series of symptoms and conditions that may be a harbinger of diabetes type 2 diabetes, high triglyceride levels, as well as reducing your risk of heart disease. In a nutshell, you want to choose foods that avoid large spikes in your insulin levels. The glycemic index is a way to rank foods according to the effect they have on our blood glucose levels. This is especially true in regards to carbohydrates, a revolutionary approach to an age-old problem. Specifically, the glycemic index measures how much a 50-gram portion of carbohydrates raises your blood sugar levels compared with the control. The control is either white bread or pure glucose. All carbohydrates cause some temporary rise in your blood glucose level. This is called the glycemic response. This response is affected by a variety of factors, including the amount of food eaten, the type of carbohydrates, the method used to prepare the food, as well as the degree of processing, just to name a few factors. Each food is assigned a number that ranges from 1 to 100. The highest rating 100 is the reference score for pure glucose. Foods are considered high if their score is greater than 70, moderate if it rates from 56 to 69 in the index, and low if the score is less than 55. The slower your body processes the food, the slower the insulin is released and the healthier the overall effect is on your body. And it's the food that raises your blood sugar level slowly that you, as a person desiring to lose weight, want to eat. There are several reasons for this. First, these foods, many of which you'll discover are high in fiber, will just keep you feeling fuller for a longer period of time. Any of us who have been on a diet can be thankful for this. The longer we feel satisfied, the less the temptation to visit vending machine hell at your workplace, grab that bag of chips on the way home from work, or sit down with those cheese puffs once you do get home. How does the index work? Your body performs at its best when it's being provided with a constant supply of blood sugar. Any foods that cause your blood sugar to spike and then to crash or dip low again causes a host of physical symptoms in your system, leading to some potentially serious health problems down the road. In fact, this sudden rush of sugar is one of the major causes of type 2 diabetes, which by the way, is being diagnosed in epidemic proportions in our country today. You're probably much more familiar with the effects of the glycemic index on your body than the actual description of it. When your blood sugar drops too low, then your body responds by causing a general tiredness, what we have come to call a sugar crash. For many of us, it happens shortly after lunchtime. Three in the afternoon seems to be one of the favorite times for this to strike. Sound familiar now? We move to cure this feeling of lethargy by eating a snack, and usually an unhealthy one at that. Many of us turn to a candy bar, and this indeed solves the problem, at least momentarily. But a candy bar only raises our glucose level quickly. And you now know what's about to happen next. Crash. The glucose level will only fall again. Indeed, we've created the proverbial vicious cycle. By choosing foods low in the glycemic index, however, we provide circumstances that are ripe for a slow and constant release of glucose. By choosing foods low in the glycemic index, however, we provide circumstances that are ripe for a slow and constant release of glucose into the bloodstream. The result is that we have a sustainable supply of energy all day long. The rises and dips of the glucose level become a thing of the past. So, what factors determine the numbers that we find in the glycemic index? 
Several primary factors go into creating this ranking system. The structure of the simple sugars in the food you eat, the amount of cellular fiber in the foods, and the fat content of the food and its protein content. All complex carbohydrates, think grains, breads, and vegetables here, cannot enter the bloodstream as they are. The molecules are just too large, so your body breaks them down into chemically smaller substances called simple sugars. Your body uses two types of carbohydrates. The first type is called a complex carbohydrate. These are most commonly found in natural foods. Composed of long chains of sugar molecules, the liver gradually breaks down this food into the shorter glucose molecules, which the brain can use for fuel. You can think of complex carbohydrates as time-released capsules of sugar. These are, for the most part, the foods that rank low in the glycemic index. Complex carbohydrates are whole grains, fruits, and vegetables. Simple carbohydrates explained. By contrast, the other type of carbohydrate is classified as simple. Consider this a quick injection of sugar into your bloodstream. These are the carbs that spike your glucose and insulin levels and then bring them down quickly again. Eating simple carbohydrates may fill you momentarily, but you'll be hungry shortly after eating them. All carbohydrates are composed of only three different types of sugar. Each one of these possesses a different molecular structure, and that is what ultimately determines the entry rate into the bloodstream. Glucose is the most common of the three. The other two are fructose and galactose. Foods that naturally contain glucose are grains, pasta, bread, cereals, starches, and vegetables. The sugar fructose can be found in fruits for the most part, and galactose is the sugar that is naturally occurring in dairy products. Each of these three sugars is quickly absorbed by your liver, but of these, only glucose can be released directly into the bloodstream. Glucose is the most common of the three. The other two are fructose and galactose. This is why glucose-rich carbohydrates, the breads and pasta, seem to race from your liver back into the bloodstream. The other two sugars take longer because they must be converted into glucose before they can get into the blood. Of the other two sugars, fructose takes the longest to convert. You'll notice this reflected in the glycemic index of most fruits. Their numbers are very low. The second factor involving the glycemic index is fiber. Fiber, by the way, is the non-digestible portion of a carbohydrate. It really has no direct effect on your insulin. But fiber does play an important role in the digestion process because it slows the entry rate of the absorption of other carbohydrates into your blood. So the higher the fiber content of a carbohydrate, the longer the sugar takes to gain entry into your blood, and that's a good thing. And yes, the converse is true. If you were to take the fiber content out of these foods, the sugars would wind up in your blood much quicker. Keep in mind as we move through this book that fiber prevents a flood of carbohydrate absorption. When is fat good? The third component affecting the glycemic index is the fat content of food. Like fiber, fat acts like a break on the absorption process. But beyond that, fats just make foods taste better. Probably the most boring diet in the world is fat-free, as you probably already know. Fats also are essential in signaling your body to quit eating. This, as you might expect, is vital to any weight management program. The fat that you eat causes your body to release a hormone called cholestyconin. Stored in the stomach until notified by the presence of fats, this hormone is responsible for informing the brain that you're satisfied. We'll talk more about fats in the next chapter. Just as there are good and bad carbohydrates, there are varying degrees of fats as well, and we'll talk more about that in the next chapter as well. The final factor that helps to determine glucose's rate of absorption is the protein content of the food. When it comes down to satisfying your hunger pangs, especially for the long haul, protein seems to have it all over other fats and carbohydrates. Surprised? Proteins make you feel fuller, and for longer periods of time. Not only that, but protein also helps you stay alert. But beware, again we have the good guys and bad guys of the protein world. One of the major criticisms of the Atkins diet is that many who adhere to it don't discriminate between good protein and bad protein. You'll always want to choose lean protein, whether it's fish, beef, chicken, or plant-based protein. In the next chapter, we'll talk more about some good choices of protein. Why is slow better? Good question. First, you need to know what happens when a carbohydrate enters your bloodstream quickly. The first step in this process is the response of the pancreas. It responds by secreting not just insulin, but high levels of this hormone. Basically, this is what the body was created to do, because this action lowers the blood sugar levels. But at the same time, it also instructs your body to store fat and keep it scored. That's exactly why eating an excess of high glycemic carbohydrates not only makes you fat, but keeps you fat. Now you're beginning to see the big picture. Here's a quick overview of what's high and what's low. As we've stated, fructose is also a slow-moving sugar. 
So just about all fruits, with the exception of bananas and dried fruits, are low in the glycemic index. So are all vegetables that are abundant in fiber. The exceptions here are carrots and corn. Higher on the glycemic index are just about all grains, starches, and pasta. But more than mere outward symptoms, continually eating foods high in the glycemic index confuses your system. It's much like the fable of the little boy who cried wolf, and I'll show you why. Every time you eat a food that's ranked high in the glycemic index, your body's producing insulin, and a good deal of it, in response to the glucose in your system. Glucose can't travel anywhere in your body without being escorted by insulin. The two go together like peanut butter and jelly. If your body does not make enough insulin, or if your system is not able to use the insulin present, the cells cannot use the glucose. So where does the glucose go? Absolutely nowhere. It just loiters in the bloodstream, which eventually sets your system up for diabetes. Another way to measure glucose, the glycemic load. The glycemic index is a tool that measures the rise and a specific amount of carbohydrates, usually 50 grams. This is all well and good for most foods. But when we're talking about some vegetables, the amount of the food needed in order to accumulate 50 grams of carbohydrates is beyond what any one person would eat, even if you love veggies. Take broccoli, for example. To properly assess the glycemic index of this food would require 16 cups of steamed broccoli, a bit much even for the most enthusiastic of broccoli lovers among us. Because of this glitch, you'll find that more values have been determined for grains, starches, and fruits than for vegetables. And this is where the term glycemic load comes in. Perhaps you've heard it mentioned in your travels, through the net, or in your discussions with others. It's simply another way to determine the rise in glucose levels. It's the product of the number of grams of insulin stimulating carbohydrates times the glycemic index for that particular carbohydrate. The lower the glycemic load, the lower the insulin stimulation of that food. In some ways, it's a more accurate measurement. Consider this. One cup of apple and one cup of broccoli both have similar glycemic index ratings. Yet, if you calculate their glycemic load, you'll discover that the apple generates more insulin, about six times the amount than the single cup of broccoli does. If you decide to investigate the glycemic loads of foods, you want to keep any one meal below the 3,000 mark. If you're eating low-density carbohydrates, this should be no problem at all. If, however, you're emphasizing large amounts of grains and other starch-based carbohydrates, this may be difficult to do. Here's a good rule of thumb to remember when you're looking for foods with a low glycemic load. The more the food has been processed, the higher, for the most part, the glycemic load will be. For example, boiled beans have a much lower load value than the same amount of canned beans. And then if you put the beans into soup and boil them, the load number actually skyrockets. That's because the cooking breaks the cell walls of the bean, making it easier for your body to digest the food into the simple sugars. And that's why many nutrition experts advise that you choose carbohydrates from high-quality vegetables in order to maintain a healthy insulin response. Insulin resistance, a serious problem. Insulin works differently in your body if you're overweight or obese. The extra fat tissues actually make your body resistant to the natural actions of insulin. This means that your muscle, fat, and liver cells are not properly utilizing the release of the insulin. As you eat too many of the foods that are high in the glycemic index, those that spurt that glucose directly into your bloodstream, your pancreas tries hard to keep up by producing ever-increasing amounts of insulin. But this just produces a flood of these substances. They really don't have anywhere to go after a while. And this is where the real havoc is being played out. Unknowingly, you're damaging your system, slowly but surely. And one of the end results just may be the development of type 2 diabetes. At latest count, nearly 16 million people have type 2 diabetes. The shocking part of the statistic, however, is that within the last 10 years, this rate has increased by nearly one-third. You may think that diabetes is no big deal, that it can be treated easily with insulin or other medication, but treatment doesn't mean cure. If the possible consequences of diabetes itself doesn't frighten you, possible amputation of your toes or a leg, and the very real possibility of resulting kidney damage, then perhaps further investigation of accompanying health conditions may surprise and horrify you. Individuals who have type 2 diabetes are also at an increased risk for developing heart disease, obesity, and even cancer. And it's really not surprising that eating according to the glycemic index may help control your type 2 diabetes. This diet was originally formulated specifically for those individuals who suffer from this disorder. Two glucose storage locations. The body stores excess glucose into two locations, your muscles and your liver. If the glycogen is stored in the muscles, your brain can't use it. The glycogen being stored by the liver, though, can be broken down to be sent back to the bloodstream to maintain adequate blood sugar levels for your brain. 
The liver has a very limited capacity to store glycogen-derived carbohydrates, so limited, in fact, that it can be depleted within 10 to 12 hours. So it's essential that the glycogen reserves be maintained continually. But what happens when you eat too many carbohydrates? The average person can store between 300 to 400 grams of carbohydrates in the muscles, where, unfortunately, they are inaccessible for any future use of your body. Elevated glucose levels are serious, more serious than you may initially think. Even if the levels don't get high enough to be classified as diabetes, the high level can still interfere with the proper functioning of your body's processes. Scientists are just now recognizing that a combination of symptoms work together to warn you of the future possible development of diabetes in your body. It's called the metabolic X syndrome. The conditions which could prelude to type 2 diabetes include the following. Elevated blood pressure. Elevated level of triglycerides. Low level of high density lipoprotein, HDL, the good cholesterol. Obesity. Resistance to insulin. All of these conditions work closely together. Metabolic X syndrome is a stunning example of how our body's processes are all interdependent. For one thing, increased insulin raises your triglyceride levels, making you at a greater risk for heart disease and strokes. It also impedes the workings of your kidneys, which, believe it or not, can lead to a raised level of blood pressure. Glucose in your brain. Your brain loves glucose. Are you surprised? Your brain, in fact, is a virtual glucose hog. In fact, glucose is the only fuel used by your brain cells. It's no wonder, then, that it consumes more than two-thirds of the carbohydrates circulating in your blood while you're resting. In order to satisfy this need, your body continually converts carbohydrates into glucose. Your brain uses glucose daily, but it uses even more of this sugar when you think. Imagine that. Have you ever noticed that when you're busy studying something or working on some project that demands you concentrate for long periods of time, you're tired? It's not just your imagination. Your body is rapidly burning up glucose during this extended mental activity. Recent research shows that prolonged concentration actually does drain glucose from a vital area of the brain associated with memory and learning. Now you're beginning to get a clear idea of just how critical this blood sugar is for proper brain function. Neurons, those brain cells that communicate with each other, are constantly in need of energy. This is because they're always in a state of metabolic activity. That doesn't mean you have to continually eat in order to feed this little piggy. Carbohydrates that your body doesn't use immediately following a meal are stored in the form of glycogen, which is a long string of glucose molecules linked together. Feed your brain right. Just how vital is food to your brain function? If the results of several studies are any indication, food, in particular the proper carbohydrates, are extremely vital. According to Dr. Carol Greenwood, eating foods high in carbohydrates can improve memory within an hour after ingestion in healthy elderly people. In one study, Dr. Greenwood had a group of healthy senior citizens eat a bowl of cereal with milk and a glass of white grape juice for breakfast. A control group only drank water. Twenty minutes later, the two groups were tested. Those who ate the cereal had the better memory. Their memory was so good, in fact, that they could remember 25% more than those who only drank water. And here are the results of another study showing that eating when you first wake up in the morning can aid your memory. Eating carbohydrates, though, seems to spark longer-term memory benefits than either fats or proteins. Again, the study was conducted by Dr. Greenwood, who said this shows the need for breakfast, which include nutritious carbohydrates, those that contain plenty of fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. Donuts and pastries, she continued, shouldn't be eaten first thing in the morning, but if you do, at least you have an excuse when you mess up at work before noon. Glycemic Index and Cravings you can make the glycemic index work to battle your cravings as well. And when you're trying to lose weight, this may be among the most exciting news you'll be reading in this entire book. And don't try to deny it. According to recent research, it appears that if you're a woman, you experience cravings about 10 times throughout a single day. The most common times it appears for these cravings to pop up are at 10 a.m. and at 4 p.m. Interestingly, though, these cravings correspond almost exactly to your low blood sugar levels, as well as your low levels of serotonin. If you're not familiar with this substance, it's the chemical that propels women to eat. Apparently, according to the latest research, in fact, it produces such a strong drive to eat that it's really quite difficult to overcome. Now we have another excuse to get caught with our spoon in the Ben & Jerry's ice cream carton. Research performed at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology's Clinical Research Center uncovered this truth when it uncovered a relationship between carbohydrates in the brain and weight loss. Dr. Jay Wertman, lead researcher of the study, along with his colleagues, demonstrated that eating carbohydrates high in the glycemic index raise the levels of serotonin in the brain. 
The results also demonstrated that women suffering from premenstrual syndrome eat too many carbohydrates and consequently gain weight. Others overeat when they are depressed or angry in an effort to balance these serotonin levels. What triggers men's food cravings? This, though, is in contrast to men, who don't seem to be affected by low levels of serotonin, but that doesn't mean they don't succumb to cravings. It's just that their cravings are triggered by the testosterone hormone. Men eat, according to this same research, to raise their levels of testosterone. If the trigger for overeating is different from women, so are the types of food. Men crave high-protein foods, like hamburgers, ribs, and steaks. When you choose foods that release glucose into your bloodstream slowly, it will mean that you won't be hungry again for a while. Foods like oatmeal, brown rice, pasta from whole grains, and a variety of vegetables will not only help with those pesky cravings, but it will also help make losing the fat much easier. Now that you understand a little bit more about how the glycemic index works and what the consequences are to your body, we can clue you on some of the secrets of smart eating in order to make the index work not only for your weight loss program, but for your energy level and overall good health as well. Chapter 2. The Secrets of Smart Eating Revealed. Carbohydrates, Proteins, and Good Fats. I see you standing there with that knife and fork in hand, ready to start this fabulous new eating plan. But wait, this isn't the chapter where you get to start eating. Not yet. This is the chapter in which we still talk about various food choices, like proteins and good fats, in addition to those carbohydrates. But not to worry. You'll get your chance to start your new eating habits soon. First, we're going to talk about the importance of the three macronutrients your body needs for good health. Carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. As you recall from the previous chapter, each of these influences the rate glucose enters your bloodstream. There's been an entire mythology that's grown around the macronutrients. Each of these carries with its own world of half-truths, rumors, and wishful thinking. But few of us really know the truth about these essential building blocks of good nutrition. It's time to bust through the myths to get deeper. It's time to reveal the truth. Once you understand what's really going on with these parts of your diet, then you'll have a firmer grasp of how the glycemic index works, and more importantly, how you can, with very little effort, put it to work creating abundant good health and weight loss. Carbohydrates, more than meets the eye. Carbohydrates. In many circles, they've definitely received a bum rap. People blame carbs, as we've come to affectionately call them, for all the evils of health and weight problems these days. Indeed, some carbohydrates do cause untold health woes within your body. And some carbohydrates do play havoc with your weight. But you're about to learn a universal truth about carbohydrates. Not all carbohydrates are created equal. Some carbohydrates can actually work with your system, not only to help make weight loss easier, but to help you keep it off. Some can actually help you avoid, for as long as possible, those diseases we most often associate with the aging process. Diabetes, heart disease, arthritis, and even cancer. But you need to know which ones. And that's exactly what the glycemic index is all about. By using this simple rating system, it not only helps you to avoid cravings throughout the day, you can intelligently choose foods that can keep you feeling fuller for a long period of time. Carbohydrates are broken into two types, simple and complex. We've already touched on these briefly as we initially talked about the glycemic index, but now we're delving into these ideas a little bit deeper. Knowing the difference between the good and bad carbohydrates can either make or break your weight loss management efforts. Carbohydrates, your true energy source. Carbohydrates are your body's primary source of energy, and while there are foods that are higher than others in carbohydrates, just about every food you eat possesses at least some of these energy promoters. But yes, you'll find them especially in whole grains, vegetables, fruits, legumes, and even some dairy products. Your body converts these carbohydrates into glucose, a natural sugar. In time, the glucose dissolves into your bloodstream, then travels to those parts of your system that need the energy. The two major areas of your body that use the most glucose are your brain, as we spoke about briefly in the previous chapter, and your muscles. As the fuel for your energy delivery system, you can see that carbohydrates play a vital role in the healthy functioning of your body. But more than that, foods rich in carbohydrates also contain an abundance of nutrients and essential building blocks of health as well, including vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants, which medical science now believe help to keep a host of degenerative age-related diseases at bay. Simple carbohydrates are so named because their chemical composition is rather simple. Foods known as simple carbohydrates are composed of only one or two sugars. For example, the sugar that you may use to sweeten your coffee or tea is a simple sugar. It's composed only of cane sugar. Similarly, other foods classified as simple carbohydrates include candy. These foods, because of their non-complicated composition, are broken down quickly by your body. 
but these are the only foods that are considered simple carbohydrates. Fruits are also qualified as simple carbohydrates, as is milk. Even though they break down quickly and enter your bloodstream fast, fruit and milk are much better for your system than the white refined cane sugar, soda pop, and other junk foods. To be called a complex carbohydrate, a food must have at least three sugars in it. Grains, breads, pastas, oatmeal, and rice are good examples of complex carbohydrates. Some vegetables can be incredibly good sources of complex carbohydrates as well. Broccoli, for example, is a great source of complex carbs. Just about all kinds of legumes, like kidney beans and black beans, are rich sources of this vital fuel. Low carbohydrate diets. Do they work? Are they safe? For a while, the low carbohydrate diet was all the rage. I'm sure you remember. Popularized by such doctors as Robert Atkins, it seemed like the entire nation had sworn off eating any form of carbohydrates. Dieters stampeded to the buffet table, loading their plates with a pile of proteins and shunning the whole grains, pastas, and cereals. Specifically, this type of diet recommended that you eat more protein to offset this lack of carbs. In fact, many diets recommended a minimum of 30% protein and upwards of 50% of your daily foods from proteins. By restricting your carbohydrates intake, your body enters a different metabolic state called ketosis. In this state, your body burns its own fat in order to get fuel instead of the carbohydrates that it normally burns. While your body is in this state of ketosis, you feel less hungry and you naturally eat less than you usually do. While this sounds great, there is a downside to this process. Ketosis isn't without its potential problems. It can create some adverse effects in the form of some health issues, like kidney problems. In addition to kidney problems, that in extreme cases may lead to kidney failure. You may also notice that your cholesterol levels are rising. This is especially true if, as part of the diet, you're eating a lot of red meat. Low carbohydrate diets have been associated with an increase in osteoporosis and kidney stones. Diets in which the majority of the calories eaten come from protein force your body to excrete more calcium than you normally would throughout your urine. Diets in which the majority of the calories eaten come from protein force your body to excrete more calcium than you normally would through your urine. After an extended period, this can increase your risk of osteoporosis kidney stones. High protein, low carbohydrate diets may also increase your risk factor for cancer. While you're busy eating those proteins, you're also not eating enough of those wonderful complex carbohydrates like fruits and vegetables. And these foods contain an abundance of phytonutrients and antioxidants that provide your body with natural protection from cancer and other degenerative diseases. And all these dangers don't even begin to detail the health risk of ketosis itself. While your body is in ketosis, it burns a substance known as ketones, which eventually may cause your organs to fail. In the process, you may experience gout, kidney stones, and eventually kidney failure. Proteins, the multi-purpose micronutrient. Say the word protein to a person, and it immediately conjures up several images, that of red meat, dairy products, and maybe even those protein mixes bodybuilders love to take. Inevitably, these images are accompanied by thoughts of a saturated fat floating everywhere, and especially throughout your bloodstream. But despite current myths, not all proteins are high in fats. We need to finally realize that we need protein, but good lean protein, and don't worry, there's plenty of lean protein from which to choose. If carbohydrates are the fuel your body uses for energy, proteins are the key to your maintenance and growth of every part of your body. Our bodies need protein in order to build strong muscles, healthy skin, and keep our internal organs functioning properly. Proteins are also in demand as they travel throughout the bloodstreams as hormones and a variety of enzymes. Proteins, by the way, are also the only food source of nitrogen. They are also the only way our bodies can get eight essential amino acids. These substances are called essential because your body cannot make them, so it must get them from your diet. If carbohydrate if carbohydrates, provide our system, if carbohydrates provide our systems with the fuel we need to convert into energy, proteins keep the maintenance of our bodies in top running order. In many ways, these two types of foods go hand in hand. Consider, for example, your immune system. Your antibodies are composed of proteins. We're all well aware that antibodies are essential to fighting and resisting diseases. If your immune system is low, you're at a greater risk for contracting colds. Not only does your body need proteins in order to keep your hair, skin, and nails nourished, but proteins are used in healing and repairing injuries. Two forms of proteins. Proteins come in two forms, complete and incomplete. Complete proteins are derived from animal sources or meat. 
Beef, chicken, fish, and a host of dairy products are prime examples of complete proteins. In contrast, an incomplete protein is one that comes from plant foods. These can be found in grains, nuts, vegetables, or legumes. They're called incomplete because they only provide your body with a limited number of amino acids, not the full complement of 22 your body needs to function properly on a daily basis. Every day we eat an array of both complete and incomplete proteins, ensuring that our bodies receive all the amino acids necessary for health and Every day we eat an array of both complete and incomplete proteins, ensuring that our bodies receive all the amino acids necessary for healthy maintenance and proper functioning of all of our organs. In fact, some of our most common meals instinctively combine both complete and incomplete sources to ensure our bodies receive a full array of this vital micronutrient. When we eat bread with cheese or cereal with milk, we're automatically creating a completed protein. And don't think you really need to eat your bread and cheese or even your cereal and milk at the same meal. Recent studies show that as long as you eat the pear sometime throughout the same day, your body still gains the benefits. Sources of protein. Not sure what foods are good sources of protein? Here are a few, here are a few examples along with the rough serving. Food. Tuna, 6 ounces. Amount of protein, 40 grams. Salmon, 3 ounces. 23 grams. Milk, 8 ounces. 8 grams. Yogurt. 8 ounces, 10 grams. Cheddar cheese, 8 ounces, 87 grams. Egg, 1, 6 grams. Cottage cheese, 4 ounces, 14 grams. How much protein does your body need? That's a slightly more complicated question than you might think. The amount of protein your, the amount of protein your unique body needs depends on two main factors, your age and your weight. It's easy enough to determine, though. Basically, you're going to take your weight and multiply it by a predetermined number based on the information provided below. If you're an adult who exercises little, multiply your weight by 0.4. Exercises regularly, multiply your weight by 0.5. Is an athlete, multiply your weight by 0.8. Uses bodybuilding to create muscle mass, multiply your weight by 0.7. If you're a growing teenager athlete, if you're a growing teenage athlete, multiply your weight by 0.9. This means if you're a 150 pound person who exercises little the amount of protein you need for a day is 60 grams. This means if you're a 150 pound person who exercises little, the amount of protein you need for a day is 60 grams. If you're an adult who exercises regularly, your protein requirements total 50 If you're an adult who exercises regularly, your protein requirements total 75 grams for the day. Welcome to our fat phobic society. If myths have built up around both carbohydrates and proteins, a tornado of myths have attached themselves to fats, so much so that we are without a doubt a fat phobic society. But that doesn't change the facts on the macronutrient we love to hate. Even though they're much maligned, fats continue performing some impressive tasks furthering our continued good health. Perhaps Dr. Barry Sears said it best in his book, The Zone, when he explains the importance of these macronutrients to our continued good health. You have to eat fat to lose fat. Now there's a contradiction for you, but you don't have to take my word for it. Indeed, you don't even need to take Dr. Sears' word for it either. Let's take a quick look at a scientific trial that left the medical community more than a little puzzled, and you'll see exactly what we're dealing with. We knew it half a century ago, but never really listened. Indeed, more than 50 years ago, groundbreaking research showed the importance of fats in the process of weight loss. But it seemed no one cared to take this research seriously enough to either continue studying it or acting on it. Had they, perhaps our society today, could have bypassed that whole low-fat diet craze, saving many of us from the heartbreak of continued weight gain. Just read the following results from a research project. As early as the 1950s, in fact, doctors as early as the 1950s, in fact, doctors Keckwick and Pawan at the University of London published what has become a landmark study on the subject. They placed patients on a low-calorie diet, a thousand-calorie diet to be exact. Pretty darn low, right? Despite this restrictive calorie intake, the diet was high in fat. The individuals undergoing this trial experienced significant weight loss. So, you say? That's not surprising given the low amount of calories they ate. But just wait until you read the rest of the study. The researchers then placed these participants on the 1,000 calorie diet, but this time 90% of their calories came from carbohydrates. The individuals experienced no significant weight loss, even though they ate the same amount of calories as before. Hmm, what's going on here? Let's check out another research project. 
Dr. Frederick Bonneau of the Oakland Naval Hospital in California tested seven men. Each of these gentlemen weighed between 230 and 290 pounds. Initially, the doctor placed the participants on a fast. That's right, they ate absolutely nothing. Theoretically speaking, nothing could possibly make weight drop faster than a good fast, now right? Well, that's what one would think anyway. Indeed, they did lose the weight. On average, the men lost 21 pounds in a mere 10 days. And this sounds pretty cool. I can see you running to sign up for this plan. But wait, because the story definitely doesn't end here. Dr. Bonneau then placed the participants on a 1,000 calorie diet. This diet contained very little carbohydrates, some protein, but a great deal of fat. What happened? You guessed it. They lost weight, nearly 14 pounds on average. But more importantly, they lost very little muscle, just about a half a pound each. Now though, we're into the realm of half-truth and wishful thinking. The half-truth is that you can eat any type of fat you like and your health will still remain optimal. And the wishful thinking is that bacon finally is a wonder food. Calm down, neither of those is true. The fact of the matter is that just as there are good carbs and bad carbs, good proteins and bad proteins, ah, now you're beginning to see the big picture. There are indeed good fats and bad fats. And what distinguishes one from the other? Boy, am I glad you asked that. Fat, a nutrient in disguise. It may have surprised you to read at the start of this chapter that fat is considered one of the three macronutrients we need for good health. And it's true. It surely is a nutrient just as vitamin C and iron are nutrients. The continued healthy production of your cell membranes, in fact, depends on your continued consumption of fats. Not only that, but fats are needed in order to create compounds called eocosinoids, which resemble hormones. Your body requires these eocosinoids for the proper regulation of many of the daily functions of your life, like your blood pressure, your heart rate, blood vessel construction, and blood clotting. Even the general functioning of your nervous system depends on a healthy supply of these eucosinoids. Not convinced of their importance yet? Then would it surprise you to learn that these essential compounds also work with proteins to keep your hair and skin healthy? And if you really dig down into your body, you'll discover that even your vital organs are dependent on the eucosinoids. And they keep your body insulated as well. But for the moment, you're probably most concerned with another amazing talent they happen to be equipped with. They keep you feeling satisfied after you finish that delicious meal. More, however, is not better. Now I really don't expect you to run out and drink a half gallon of olive oil. More is definitely not better. But you do need a moderate amount. And when you start severely restricting your intake of fats, especially the good ones, then you run into problems. You know all too well that when you eat large quantities of food that contain unhealthy fats, and we'll be talking more about exactly which ones these are momentarily, you're placing yourself in danger of increasing your odds of developing not only obesity, but heart disease as well. Consumption of unhealthy fats may also increase your risk of certain forms of arthritis, increased inflammation and diabetes, and that's only the tip of the iceberg. When it comes to fat, there are two kinds, saturated and unsaturated. I could just as easily cut to the chase and tell you about the specific type of polyunsaturated fat called omega-3 and why your body requires it, but that would be doing you a slight disservice. You also need to know about the unhealthy varieties and why you should stay away from these as much as possible. Saturated fat, the villain of fats. Yeah, you could look at saturated fat this way. It's definitely the bad guy, no matter which way you slice them. Saturated fat is found for the most part in animal products. It's a type of fat that is in red meat, poultry, and even butter and whole milk. And saturated fat is a substance that's implicated in raising your blood cholesterol levels as well as increasing your risk of developing heart disease. But they're easy to recognize. At room temperature, they solidify. Bacon fat is a great example of this. I remember when I was young how my grandmother actually saved the fat from the bacon. When it was hot, she poured it into a container. When it cooled to room temperature, it solidified. Then she would spoon it out to use again when she needed to fry something else. Lard and butter are also examples of saturated fat. Just about all the health experts agree, by the way, that saturated fat should compose no more than 10% of your total calories for the day. That means if you eat 2,000 calories a day, you should consume no more than 20 grams of saturated fat. Unsaturated fat, by far the better choice. Compared with saturated fat, unsaturated fat is indeed the healthier of the two. And depending on the type of unsaturated fat you eat, this category of fat can actually help you improve your overall health, lower your risk of developing certain diseases, and as we have seen, even help you lose weight. And you caught that reference to, I'm betting to the type of unsaturated fat you eat. Yes, within this category, we can find several types of fats. First, let's examine monounsaturated fat. 
It stands in contrast to the saturated variety because at room temperature it remains a liquid. Only if you place it in the refrigerator for an extended period, you may find that it begins to solidify. Oils rich in monounsaturated fats include olive, peanut, and canola. You can find several nutritious foods containing this type of oil as well, most, notab most notably avocados and just about all varieties of nuts. That brings us to the next category of unsaturated fat, the polyunsaturated kind. You recognize these immediately because not only do they stay in a liquid state at room temperature, but they also remain liquefied in your refrigerator as well. For this reason, you find these mostly in a variety of vegetable oils, corn, safflower, sunflower, soy, and cottonseed, omega-3 fatty acids, a healthy boost to your system. But now, there's still one more category of fat we need to cover. And actually, it's a subcategory of polyunsaturated. It's called omega-3. No doubt you've heard about it. It's making quite a stir in some health circles lately. This type of oil is mostly found in seafood, especially in salmon, halibut, shrimp, and snapper. But you can find it in several other types of foods as well. Omega-3s can be found in flaxseed walnuts, tofu, and winter squash. The health news regarding these fats is exciting. They seem to be able to help a great variety of our ills, from heart disease to bipolar disorder. And while no single supplement or nutrient can ever be considered a panacea, omega-3 fatty acid appears that it could be an overall boost to your general well-being. As of yet, we've not talked about the deadliest of the fats, trans fat. I didn't place it in the category with unsaturated or saturated, and for good reason. Trans fatty acids are purely man-made fats, that's right. They've been in the news quite a bit in the last couple of years. Let's just say that no one has anything good to say about these deadly fats. Yes, deadly. Did you know that each year some 30,000 premature deaths can be traced back directly to the consumption of trans fatty acids? That's frightening. What makes trans fatty acids so deadly? The substances in this fat actually interfere with the metabolic processes of your body. And to add insult to injury, your body has no natural defense mechanism in place to help protect itself against these very unnatural fats. Trans fatty acids are used in many restaurants to fry foods in. Not only that, but they're also used in a wide variety of packaged snacks to help create a longer shelf life. How are trans fatty acids made? The creation of trans fats occur when oils are solidified during a process called partial hydrogeneration. The creation of trans fats occur when oils are solidified. The creation of trans fats occur when oils are solidified during a process called partial hydrogenation. The oil is heated and hydrogen bubbles are then passed through it. During this period, the fatty acid acquires a portion of the hydrogen, which causes the oil to be cleansier than it normally would be. During this period, the fatty acid acquires a portion of the hydrogen, which causes the oil to be denser than it normally would be. Margarine, by the way, accounts for nearly one quarter of all the trans fats we consume today. If you're eating margarine to avoid the fats found in butter, you're doing your body a grave injustice. Most margarine is actually twice as bad for your health as butter is. Some types, however, now come in trans fat-free varieties. Even though you need to eat fat to lose fat, you really do need to discriminate when it comes to the types of fat you consume. Omega-3 fatty acids are by far one of the most powerful health tools we've discovered in a long time. Not only that, it now appears that this type of fat can also play a vital role in keeping you feeling satisfied on your weight loss program. Along with proteins and fiber, healthy fats play an important role in keeping your insulin and glucose levels in balance. In these coming chapters, We'll learn how to use these natural substances to flip the switch on your glucose making machine. You'll soon be choosing the right foods that will help you keep those levels well under control. And you can be sure your body will thank you for that, not only with the seemingly effortless drop in pounds, but with an increased functioning of your systems and renewed energy as well. Chapter 3 Becoming a Smart Eater Investigating the Glycemic Index Now we're ready to delve a little deeper into the workings of the glycemic index. No, you won't need that knife and fork yet. Just relax, we'll get to the eating part of this diet eventually. The glycemic index separates food into three separate categories, all based on how quickly they make your insulin levels rise, rapidly inducing the glucose level. Once you begin to study this new way of rating foods, you'll notice some rather surprising findings. I'm guessing you're probably currently eating at least one food that you consider healthy and good for your body that may indeed be spiking your insulin levels. Let's get right to the point and talk about the first category on the GI ranking system those foods that rapidly induce your glucose level. Right from the start, you're in for a startling revelation. Do you eat those rice cakes that became wildly popular about a decade or so ago? You know, they come in countless flavors now. 
Dieters ate them like candy because of their sweetness and their lack of fat, and now we're beginning to see just why they may not be good for us. Well, they're one of the worst offenders of raising that glucose level off the map. Foods, as we've noted, are ranked on a 0 to 100 index, with 0 being the slowest and inducing your insulin, and glucose release and 100 being the fastest. So where do the rice cakes fall? At a whopping 71. Wow, that is high. So now the question is asked, how many times did you choose rice cakes over the ice cream that the rest of the family ate for dessert? Hmm, I thought so. So do you want to know the ranking of ice cream too? This way you can see how you fared with those choices. Ice cream, regular ice cream with the fat, ranks at 61. And fat-free ice cream averages out at about 50. So you think you're eating healthy. Did you think you were eating healthy today when you had that bowl of cornflakes for breakfast? Surprise! It ranks up there on the glycemic index. It earns a stunning 83 out of 100. But don't even bother reaching for those other cereals. It doesn't appear any of them are much better. Rice Krispies have a ranking of 82. Puffed wheat comes in slightly lower, but is still considered high at a 74. And even golden grams at 71 on the glycemic index are rapid inducers of insulin. The real surprise may be that watermelon, that all-American summertime food, ranks in an astounding 72, even though many of us would consider it a healthy treat. Potatoes, too, whether you fry them or bake them, end up spiking your insulin levels. In fact, baking only makes the situation worse. A baked potato is rated on 85 on the list, where french fries come in at 75. Yes, they're still high. This, though, is a perfect example of how fat can help slow the absorption of glucose. Unfortunately, the fat in this instance usually isn't the right variety. Can't resist that baguette at your local bakery? If you plan on following the index, it appears that you may just have to learn to say no. It ranks 95 out of 100 on the glycemic index. And not surprisingly, you'll find plenty of junk food listed here, filled with calories, void of nutrition, and just waiting to enter your system and spike your insulin and glucose levels. Pretzels, considered by many on a low-fat diet to be a safe alternative to other junk foods, rates an 81 on this index. Corn chips, by the way, come in at 74. In addition to these curious quirks are some no-brainers. For example, donuts weigh in at a hefty 76 on the index, as do waffles. But your white, refined rolls don't fare well either at a ranking of 73. Medium inducers of glucose. These are foods that rank from a 56 on the glycemic index to a 69. And here again, you discover a natural array of foods, many of which you've no doubt been eating because you consider them healthy. Oat bran and brown rice, for example, both are borderline medium glycemic foods with a ranking of 55. But that's exactly what popcorn pops in at it. But that's exactly what popcorn pops in at and spaghetti, wheat variety no less, tops off at as well. Mangoes, even though they're a fruit, are a medium inducer of insulin with a ranking of 56. Wild rice can get your insulin moving moderately fast with its G1 ranking of 57. Wild rice can get your insulin moving moderately fast with its GI ranking of 57. And for all of you who've been eating those brand muffins, thinking you're doing your body healthy, well, you sort of are. A muffin comes in at 62, just two points better than that gooey macaroni and cheese you try to avoid. Just think, macaroni and cheese is easier in your glucose and insulin than watermelon. What is this world coming to anyway? Not only that, some candy bars rank below watermelon. Let's revisit those potatoes again, only this time let's prepare the veggie a little differently. We finally found a way to keep our insulin down as we eat them. If they're served as mashed potatoes, they're in the high range of the medium inducers, but still better than eating it baked. If you steam your potatoes, though, the ranking falls to a 56. It's still on the medium range, but we're making progress. Any food in the medium range of the glycemic index can be eaten in moderation. Low inducers of insulin. Okay, you sigh. Yes, I can hear you all the way over here. What's left? Don't look so glum. Did you really expect to be able to eat ice cream, baguettes, and french fries all day long? Plenty of foods rank low in the glycemic index. In fact, it's in this category you'll find some of the healthiest and most filling foods. Got a yearning for yogurt? Low-fat, unsweetened yogurt ranks low at 14. Peanuts rank at a healthy 15. So help yourself to a serving of nuts. And one of the most attractive aspects of peanuts are the healthy oils you find in them. And look at this list of vegetables that all come in at 15. Artichokes, asparagus, broccoli, cauliflower, celery, cucumber, eggplant, green beans. Shall I continue? Not only are these absorbed very slowly by your body, they're all abundant sources of phytonutrients and antioxidants. These veggies then not only help keep you on the right track with weight loss, they'll also help lessen your odds of acquiring a wide range of degenerative diseases as well. 
Remember those warning signs we posted on bananas and carrots as spiking your insulin levels? Bananas earn a 54 in the glycemic index. Now while these guys rank much higher than 15 like those veggies listed above, or the 38 of an apple, it's still within the low range even if it is the upper limits. So that still makes a banana a better choice than a bowl of cornflakes. Yes, carrots rank high, but... And yes, those carrots, they rank 39. So if you really love carrots, or it's the only veggie you eat, don't allow this ranking, which is still quite good, scare you away. This is only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to healthy foods from which to choose. And the best part of these choices is that you can eat as much of these foods as you want. A more complete list of foods can be found in the appendix starting on page 65. Keep in mind that any food that's listed as low can be eaten daily, and just about as much as you want, especially if the food is also low in calories. One of the exceptions is peanuts. Even though the glycemic level is low and the fat content is healthy, peanuts do have quite a few calories. Foods that are moderate inducers of insulin and glucose should be eaten in moderation. You certainly don't want to indulge in them daily, but only you can decide how often you can eat them. That, of course, would depend on your current state of health. If you have metabolic X syndrome, you'd probably want to eat them less frequently than a person who doesn't have a set of symptoms. Now let's just look at these foods from a little different angle. We're going to take the categories of food, explain why they need to be included in your diet, even if only in moderation or occasionally, and place them in general terms in the glycemic index. We're going to start with the breads and cereals group. This group creates confusion for everyone. As a whole, they rank in the medium, or even high range, on the glycemic index, yet take a look at that government-sponsored food pyramid. They form the basis of that pyramid. In fact, according to the government, we should be eating upwards of seven servings of these. Now, were you totally confused? The importance of whole grains. You've heard it over and over again for many years now. Choose whole grain over white bread. The mantra is drilled into you, and you know you should, but do you really know why? Once you realize why whole grains are better for you, you'll not only be more aware that you should eat them, but you'll be insisting that you eat an abundance of them daily. To truly understand the importance of whole grains in your diet, we have to take a short trip back in history. Whole grains, a natural part of our evolution of eating. For literally thousands of years, the grains we ate as part of our natural evolution came straight from the stock. Really, our ancestors pulled the grains straight off the stock. When they ate grains in that fashion, they enjoyed and benefited from the total package of the grain. This meant that they received the goodness of all the vitamins, healthy fats, fiber, and minerals. But what our ancient ancestors didn't know when they pulled the grains was the additional benefits it contained, like the phytochemicals, plant enzymes, and hormones. Our ancestors, in eating the grain straight from the stock, received the goodness of all of the three natural layers of grain. Grains in their natural form contain a tough, fibrous outer layer called bran. This portion protects the inside of the plant called the kernel. This kernel is securely housed inside the endosperm. The interior of the grain houses the starchy endosperm, which is assigned the task of providing stored energy for the germ, the seed's reproductive kernel. The germ is a valuable part of the grain because it houses an abundance of the vitamins, minerals, and unsaturated fats, which make these grains so vital to our good health. Then our ancestors learn how to grind the grain. The invention of the industrialized roller mills in the late 19th century changed how we ate grains. The milling process strips away the bran from the germ. This makes the grain easier to chew, digest, and to store without the need for refrigeration, which is needed to keep the healthy oils from turning rancid. But processing the grain also pulverizes the endosperm, which changes it from a small, solid nugget into literally millions of tiny bits. Refining the wheat, additionally, makes the flour fluffy, which in turn gives us those decadently delicious light airy breads and pastries. Refining what means lost fiber. Ah, but no progress comes without a price. And in this instance, we pay a price in the form of lost nutrition. The milling and refining processes strip more than half of the wheat's content of B vitamins, as well as 90% of the vitamin E content. But that's not all. Milling and processing destroys virtually all the fiber content of the wheat as well. We call the grains that have gone through these extensive processes refined grains. These contain some complex carbohydrates, but those that haven't gone through the refinement process are even better sources of complex carbohydrates. Whole grains are healthier for you and have a lower ranking on the glycemic index because their bran and germ are still intact. This makes them great sources of fiber as well. Fiber, by the way, is the portion of the plant-based food that your body doesn't digest. It's the fiber that makes your food digest slower and gives it the good ranking on the glycemic index. But before you get too enthusiastic about whole grains, you need to realize that the vast majority of whole grains rank in the medium range in the glycemic index. 
If you're ever faced with a choice of fiber from veggies and fiber from grains and cereals, you've guessed it, choose the fiber from veggies. Choose whole grains. When choosing grains, it only makes good sense and good health to choose the whole grains. We'll have a list of some of them in the appendix at the end of the book, along with their glycemic ranking. In the meantime, here's an overview of the types of grains you should be selecting to create your optimum weight loss program. Barley, buckwheat, bulgur, cracked wheat, millet, whole grain bread, pasta and crackers, brown rice, wild rice, oatmeal, popcorn. Even if you don't know the exact number of these foods on the glycemic index, you know they won't rank high. The fiber content of these foods ensures that they are at least in the medium range of the glycemic index. You won't want to eat these foods daily, as much as the food pyramid suggests, but you can eat these in moderation. By contrast, the following foods are considered refined grains. They contain far less fiber and have a higher and less desirable glycemic ranking. Cornflakes, white bread, couscous, enriched macaroni or spaghetti, grits, white rice, pretzels. These foods, as we've already noticed, rank pretty high up there in inducing your insulin levels. You'll want to eat these with much less frequency. Got protein? Here's how to make sure. Protein itself has a zero rating in the glycemic index scale. That pretty much means you can add it liberal as long as you watch out for that pesky caloric content. They all rank zero because the glycemic index ranks carbohydrates. But it's not a bad idea to add protein to your carbohydrate choices as well, and I'm sure you realize why. You probably recall the importance of protein once you start following the glycemic index. Protein helps puts the brakes on the absorption of glucose. It slows down the rise in insulin that occurs when you eat any form of carbohydrate. This means that if you add some protein to a food that ranks high on the index, you can blunt that spike in insulin and glucose. And by adding protein to foods that are naturally low, you're making an already healthy process even better. It also contains another benefit. Protein keeps you feeling full longer after you eat it. In fact, Dr. Mehmet Oz, author of You on a Diet, and a regular guest on Oprah, recommends that you include some type of protein with breakfast every day. He recognizes that this will help keep the munchies at bay later in the day. So if you're going to snack, and we all do at times, so if you're going to snack, and we all need to at times, you want to consider adding some protein to those snacks. That way you're ensuring that you're helping to slow that rise in glucose and you're making sure you won't be reaching for those potato chips with that whopping ranking on the glycemic index 10 minutes later. If you find that you aren't getting enough protein through your daily meals, snacks fortified with protein help to fill in that gap. When choosing proteins though, you need to keep in mind that you should always choose low fat. Let's face it, a slice of turkey and a slice of bacon both supply your body with protein, but the bacon won't exactly win you any Dieter of the Year awards, now will it? Bacon, as well as red meats, contain some of the less healthy fats for your diet. Here are some easy ways to increase your consumption, and relatively painlessly at that. Short of stuffing yourself with more meat, of course, that's always an option. Just make sure it's low-fat meat. Blend a cup of milk and yogurt with your favorite fruit to make what many call a smoothie. Any fruit at all will do, but consider strawberries first. Berries in general contain an abundance of antioxidants and phytonutrients that have been shown to help improve your health in general. Add some shredded cheese or some cottage cheese to your salad. An ounce of hard cheese, like cheddar, contains approximately 7 or 8 grams of protein. Cottage cheese contains about 15 grams per cup. When you snack, add protein. If you feel as if you're not receiving enough protein, don't eat that apple plain. Top it off with some peanut butter. Two tablespoons of peanut butter contains about 8 grams of protein. The apple has a glycemic index of roughly 38. If you add peanut butter to that, the glucose level should drop even more. If you find yourself munching on a cookie or a piece of cake, add a glass of milk with it. That gives you an additional 8 grams of protein, and it slows the rapidity of the insulin flowing through your bloodstream. Besides, it just tastes wonderful that way. Like fish? Boy, are you lucky. Especially if you like tuna or salmon, because these two foods just happen to be abundant in omega-3 fatty acids. If you recall from an earlier chapter, fats, just like protein and fiber, are an excellent way to slow that spike in your insulin levels. Your new eating strategy for a slower rise in your glucose level is relatively easy. Eat fish at least twice a week. At the same time, these fish-oriented meals are among the best to include your indulgence foods. You know, those foods you've already identified as high in the glycemic index, but just have to eat every now and then anyway. That's right. We realize everyone needs to indulge. That's why many of the diets today fail you miserably. They don't take into account the need to break the rules now and then and enjoy some forbidden fruit. Fish contains the perfect combination of protein and healthy fats that can help slow the conversion of carbohydrates into glucose. 
fruits and vegetables. It's true, you know. If you plan on using the glycemic index as a guideline for a new eating plan, it certainly does look like fruits and vegetables are going to become the mainstay of your new eating lifestyle. Just look at that list. The low end of the scale is filled with just about every fruit and vegetable imaginable. In some ways, this might surprise you. For many years, for example, there has been a school of thought that people trying to lose weight, and especially those who have been diagnosed with diabetes, should avoid eating fruit. These experts cited the naturally occurring fructose, a form of sugar, that all fruits seem to have an abundance of as the reason. After all, fructose is a simple carbohydrate, and we've already noted that simple carbohydrates can spike the glucose level. So what gives? Even though, as we mentioned earlier, it contains a short and simpler molecular structure, your body still needs to go through a few steps before it can actually convert it into the type of sugar that it can use, glucose. Eating fructose containing fruit is actually a great technique to avoid those hunger pangs. While this sugar is a simple carbohydrate, it's also much sweeter than table sugar. This makes them not only good choices to add to a breakfast meal, but they make ideal between meal snacks as well. Another food that has made the rounds for dieters is juicing. While initially viewed as a great way to drink your fruits, it has come under increasing attack of late. Many health experts complain that when you juice, you lose the natural fiber content of fruit. Technically, the GI ranking for a fruit juice is nearly the same as of the fruit itself, but you may want to go easy on the fruit juice. Why? If for no other reason, it's easy to drink more juice and calories than you originally had planned. Remember too that the rich fiber content of fruit is what makes it so filling. Juice just doesn't pack the same wallop on your hunger pangs. Fruits to approach with cotton. Actually, for all the bad press some of the fruits get for their GI ranking, you only need to be careful with a few of them. One of these is the banana, or you may want to eat it in combination with another fruit. Many individuals love bananas with a good old-fashioned peanut butter sandwich. This too could be a good choice. The protein and healthy fat content of the peanut butter will help to slow the rise in glucose caused by the banana. Just be sure to make your sandwich with low glycemic bread. Watch out for watermelon and pineapple. These are favorites of many people, but there's no way around it. They both rank high in the index. Watermelon ranks at an astounding 72, while pineapple rates at the upper limits of the medium portion of the glycemic index with a 66. Choose your fruit wisely and choose fruit over fats and starches, and you should experience unbounded success on your new eating adventure. Now we come to my favorite topic, veggies. And there are no better sources of nutrition, and by far no lower foods on the GI than green leafy vegetables. But more than this, these veggies are also rich in vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients, and antioxidants. Just about everything your body needs to keep it running at top form and to keep many of the most prevalent chronic diseases from striking. The exception to this is the carrot. It ranks in the medium range of the index. But don't cross it off your list completely because of this. It contains a host of healthy nutrients as well. The keys to success when it comes to the carrot is not to overindulge them and don't eat them with other foods high on the glycemic index. In fact, they're the perfect vegetable to eat with protein, especially fish. Both the protein and the healthy fats in the fish help to reduce that unwanted spike in glucose levels. Bravo for beans, hooray for nuts. Need I say more about these two closely related class of foods? Beans have a high fiber content, which make them absolutely marvelous for the dieter. In fact, you might call them nature's secret weapon when it comes to dieting, especially if you're following the broad outlines of the glycemic index. Beans have an additional hidden benefit that no one seems to talk about much. They have a natural ability to rebalance your cholesterol levels thanks to their water-soluble fiber content. And thanks to their fiber content, you'll find that beans fill you up and keep you full. And to top all of these marvelous advantages off, they're also rich in protein, another reason no doubt for their low rankings on the GI. In fact, certain beans, soybean, kidney bean, lentil, and chickpea, are bursting with so much protein that some nutritionists consider them more a meat than a legume. Low GI doesn't necessarily equate with healthy. As you've already probably noticed, just because a food is low in the glycemic index doesn't automatically make it a healthy choice. In your excitement at discovering the benefits of this new style of eating, you may mistakenly think that. The list, for example, has several foods which we can definitely classify as junk foods, nutritionally void and highly caloric, which don't spike your insulin levels as you might think. Just look at this list of foods with a glycemic index ranking of less than 40, but you really don't want to eat these every single day or even more than once a month or every six weeks if you're trying to lose weight. Junk food. Chocolate cake. GI rating, 38. No bake egg custard, 35. Sara Lee premium ice cream, 37. Chocolate milk with sugar, 34. M&Ms with peanuts, 
33. Pizza Supreme, 30. Egg Fettuccine, 32. Nestle Drink Strawberry Mix, 35. Fructose, 19. High GI but healthy. You've encountered some foods that are unusually low on the glycemic index, but are nutritionally and sound to eat every day. You've probably already noticed that some foods, which otherwise appear to be healthy choices, rank rather high in the glycemic index. While you want to be careful eating these, they still are nutritionally good for you. Don't avoid these altogether. So what types of foods are we talking about? Here are just a few. Healthy food, Nabisco shredded wheat, glycemic index, 83. Brown rice, 87. Baked potato, 85. Boiled potato, 101. Parsnips, 97. Chapter 4, How to Flip the Switch, Making Low GI Food Choices. Wow, we've digested quite a bit of information in these pages, but I believe it's well worth it. Because armed with all this knowledge about the glycemic index, fiber, fats, proteins, carbs, and everything else, food, you've learned more about why your insulin levels take you on a roller coaster ride. But more importantly, you're learning about the vital tools, tools that have been at your disposal all along, that can help you change the roller coaster ride into something that more resembles a slow and more even ride, fewer and lower jumps in your glucose. Now, still with knife and fork in hand, you're ready to put some of this knowledge to use. It's time to flip the switch. Make the natural workings of the glycemic index work for your weight loss program and good health, and not against it. This chapter is written to help you give some practical advice. This chapter is written to help give you some practical advice. Some of the ideas outlined here may already have occurred to you, while some may provide you with the insight to send you eating in the right direction, hopefully for a lifetime. Either way, these are great ideas for implementing the glycemic index into your daily life, and hopefully into the daily habits of your family. With the growing epidemic of childhood obesity, you can never ever start soon enough at teaching, and especially showing your children what good eating habits really are. Today is as good as any day to flip the switch. Use the glycemic index to lose weight and keep diabetes and other degenerative diseases from creeping up on you. Flipping the switch. Fruits and vegetables, the mainstay of your new eating plan. That's right. If you haven't paid much attention to these two categories of food before, then you're probably way past due at giving these marvelously healthy foods a try. I know that every person who has ever been on a diet has lamented the need to eat rabbit food. Oh yes, you know what I mean. Living on lettuce, munching on mangoes, gobbling grapes by the handful. Dieters seem to think that this is the most boring way to go. Today, though, I'm challenging your taste buds. Convince them that these so-called rabbit foods are some of the healthiest, tastiest foods on the planet. And indeed they are. When you eat them for life, you're really not condemning yourself to a lifetime of boring foods. Rather, you're nourishing your system with the fundamental building blocks of life, the very foods your body has been craving. Here's a challenge, noticing your energy level. Eating according to the glycemic index means many of your choices will naturally be drawn from the fruits and vegetables category. In fact, according to Dr. Jenny Brand Miller, Kay Foster Powell, and Joanna McMillan Price, the authors of The Low GI Diet Revolution, you should incorporate a minimum of seven servings of fruits and vegetables into your daily diet. By the way, that's two more servings than the U.S. government recommends. These servings they recommend should be divided into at least two servings of fruit and five vegetables. A serving size is equal to one medium-sized piece of fruit, or in the case of vegetables, a half a cup of cooked or one cup of raw veggies. Just about every food on the index is in the low or the low end of the moderate index. The two exceptions to this is olives and avocados. Fruits represent a no-brainer in this regard. They naturally contain fructose, a simple sugar you'll recall us say in an earlier chapter. This simple sugar, though, takes longer than glucose to enter your bloodstream. That's because your system must first convert the fructose into glucose, and that does take a bit of time. But the most amazing aspect of consuming an abundance of fruits and vegetables is the amount of energy these foods can provide for you. You'll be delighted. You'll be delighted with the newfound vibrancy you have. Go ahead, I dare you to eat more fruits and vegetables and tell me you don't feel immensely better. While you're eating these powerhouses of energy, you'll also be providing your body with untold benefits when it comes to your health. Entire books have been written on the health-related benefits of phytonutrients, micronutrients, and antioxidants of fruits and vegetables. But let me just list a few here to give you a glimpse of how you can be transforming your body from the inside out when you indulge in these healthy natural foods. Some health benefits explained. 
Ever hear of a beta-carotene? It's called the precursor of vitamin A. That means your body needs it to form this nutrient. Vitamin A is not only essential to good eye health, but it's also important to keep your skin healthy. Scientists now believe that a diet rich in beta-carotene may even mitigate the damage caused by excessive exposure to the sun's ultraviolet rays. So what food should you be eating to give you this protection? In addition to the obvious choice of carrots, even though they rank as one of the higher veggie choices on the index, try incorporating more apricots, peaches, mangoes, broccoli, and sweet potatoes into your menu. Everyone's well aware of the awesome health-giving power of vitamin C. It's a water-soluble antioxidant that some nutritionists call your personal bodyguard. This vitamin protects your cells from the damage caused by everyday environmental pollutants, as well as the damage that just occurs as part of the normal aging process. Some of the foods high in vitamin C include peppers, oranges, kiwi, and cantaloupe. The two above examples of the benefits of fruits and vegetables would be great in and of themselves, but there's still one more point I must make. And it involves something called anthocyanins. You've probably never heard of these things, yet they go to work for you every day. Anthocyanins are the purple and red pigments in such fruits and vegetables as blueberries, peppers, beets, and eggplant. They function much like antioxidants and maintaining good health. You want to make sure you eat foods like these on a regular basis as well. Flipping the switch, selecting low GI breads and cereals. If you're not careful, you'll discover you're reaching for foods in this category that are high on the index. Your choices should be from mixed grains foods. Some of the better choices include mixed grain breads, sourdough, traditional rolled oats, cracked wheat, pearl barley, pasta, as well as select varieties of rice. All of these foods have a slow digestion and absorption rates. All of these foods have a slow digestion and absorption rate, which means they'll fill you up and keep you satisfied for quite a long period of time. When choosing breads, some selections are definitely better than others. Whole grain breads are your best choice. These breads usually are chewier than the soft white bread you may be used to eating, but they are by far nutritionally superior. The best choices are those breads baked with the whole cereal grains, including barley, rye, oats, soy, and cracked wheat. If you can find breads that contain seeds like sunflower or linseeds, choose these. Ever hear of a pumpernickel bread? It's a specialty bread that contains 80-90% to 90 whole and cracked white kernels. It contains a dense texture. Because of this, you'll notice it comes in very thin slices. You may want to sample this bread to see if you like it, or can learn to like it. It has an incredibly low glycemic index 41. Sourdough bread, a solid low GI choice. Sourdough bread is also a healthy choice. The bread is made from a very slow and deliberate fermentation process of yeast, which produces a buildup of organic acids. It's these acids, by the way, that give the bread its distinctive taste. The glycemic index of this bread is 52, making it a great alternative to the refined breads that line the grocery store shelves. And if you have a family member who absolutely insists on white bread, you may be able to appease him with the sourdough. By the way, it makes a great slice of toast. Think about choosing stone ground or whole wheat breads. These are low glycemic choices because of the method used in milling these products. They've been milled from the entire wheat berry, the germ, endosperm, and the bran. This particular process slowly grinds the grain with a burr stone instead of the high-speed metal rollers other breads use. In this fashion, just about all of the wheat berry is retained. In addition to coming in low on the glycemic index, these types of breads are also rich sources of a variety of B vitamins, zinc, iron, and of course dietary fiber. Rye bread. In fact, any type of bread that is made with whole kernel rye should be on your shopping list. You are making one while you're reading this, aren't you? And speaking of shopping, you can buy rye flakes and use them just like you would rolled oats. Cook them for cereal or even sprinkle them over bread before you bake it. Wheat. It's about time we talk about this. This particular grain provides nourishment to more than half of the people on the planet. Here's a trick to help lower that insulin response. Soak whole wheat overnight, then simmer it for about an hour. This makes the perfect base for a pilaf. The do's and don'ts of pasta and noodles. We're a nation of pasta lovers, there's no doubt about it. And if you choose wisely, you can ensure that the pasta you love for supper tonight won't be floating aimlessly as glucose through your blood as you settle in to enjoy the movie later in the evening. One of the tricks to keeping the GI low is by pairing your pasta with foods that are naturally high in the good fats and eating plenty of vegetables with it. Serve your family pasta in a good spaghetti sauce or try making it with olive oil. But make sure that you serve a protein with that pasta as well. Fish is a great choice. Not only does the protein found in fish help to slow the insulin response, but fish is a good source of omega-3 fatty acids, another wonderful selection to blunt that spike in glucose levels.
and for the lowest possible rise in these levels, cook the pasta only to al dente. Keep the fettuccine firm. Overcooking only increases the GI range. Overcooking only increases the GI ranking, but remember, pasta can still raise your insulin levels if you eat too much. You might be disappointed to know that you shouldn't eat more than a cup at a sitting. You'll be woefully disturbed, if you like pasta as much as I do, to discover how small a portion this really is. You may even discover that what kind of pasta you choose actually influences its GI rankings. It appears, according to the latest research, that the thicker the noodle, the lower the ranking. This could be simply because it's more difficult to overcook the thicker varieties. When you're searching for noodles, it's time to get adventurous. Think East. In fact, think and buy udon, hokkien, and rice vermicelli. These are all types of Asian foods and when compared to Western versions, rank lower on the glycemic index. You may want to experiment with the cellophane noodle. Officially called lunk gao bean thread noodles, these guys came in on the glycemic index at a low 33. That makes them a great food to have on hand for any time eating. The key to the low ranking is the fact that they're made from the mung bean. You'll realize this variety in your local store because they usually are sold in bundles wrapped in cellophane. The noodles themselves are shiny and thin. Preparing them is easy too. Soak them for 10 minutes in hot water. You then add them to your meal. They're great with any stir-fry dish or even in a salad. And they're delicious too, absorbing in most instances the flavors of the other foods they're with. Flipping the switch, learning to love legumes. What the heck is a legume anyway? Many of you are asking. And I can answer that in one word. Beans, indeed. Pick a bean, any bean, chickpea, kidney bean, lentil. Even the peanut is technically considered a legume. I'll always think of it as a nut though. Legumes come in low in the glycemic index, low enough that you should think about substituting these at a meal time for the standard potato. Beans offer a whole new approach to preparing familiar meals. Use some type of bean as a side dish to a great fish dinner or even with some grilled meat, and the new combination will keep your family from complaining about eating the same foods night after night. Legumes are also rich sources of vitamins and minerals. When you eat these beans, you're nourishing your body with an abundance of B vitamins, as well as folic acid, iron, magnesium, and zinc. Not bad for a bean. To make full use of beans' insulin level properties, try to eat them twice a week as a main meal. Bean soup makes a great meal, but you can always experiment with a variety of beans, or just go online and see what recipes are available that your family may like. You don't have to lack for variety when you choose beans either. The chickpea, for example, whose glycemic index ranking comes in at a healthy 28, has long been popular in Mideast recipes and an array of Mediterranean dishes. These can be purchased dried or canned. How about the lentil? Similarly, you may want to take a taste of the lentil. If you've never eaten it before, you may be pleasantly surprised. With the glycemic index of 26, you'll find this being rich in not only protein and fiber, which help to explain its low GI ranking, but a variety of the B family of vitamins as well. The lentil itself is almost bland tasting. Some have described its flavors as earthy. They are at their best when you pair them with onions, garlic, and some of your favorite spices. Lentils make a wonderful bed for grilled fish or meat. Now there's a nice low GI meal for you. Soybeans have been in the use lately as a great food for women who are hitting menopause. But don't let this new stereotype this food. It's actually an abundant source of B vitamins, fiber, iron, and zinc for everyone, young or old, male or female. Even among the legume family, their GI ranking of 14 make them one of the lowest choices possible, and the fat content of soybean is mostly derived from the healthy polysaturated version. And the fat content of soybean is mostly derived from the healthy polyunsaturated version. Beyond a low GI rating, the true health properties of soybeans are only now being discovered, because they're rich phytonutrients and phytoestrogens. They seem to play an important role in helping balance blood cholesterol levels, as well as lowering your chances of developing cancer. The benefits of fish go well beyond its zero ranking in the glycemic index. The real benefits, the real benefits of this underrated food choice lie in the health-giving properties it has. We already know that the omega-3 content that some fish have helps to slow the insulin response of carbohydrates. But the regular consumption of fish has been known to help reduce the risk of coronary heart disease, provide improvement in the moods of individuals balancing blood fat levels, especially those triglycerides, and even helping to boost your immune system response. Indeed, just one serving of fish a week may be all it takes to lower your risk of experiencing a fatal heart attack by 40%. Wow! The best sources of omega-3 fatty acids are the oily fish varieties. You can recognize these by their dark colored flesh and their strong flavor, but don't fret if you can't get fresh. We're not all lucky enough to live on the coast. 
try canned salmon as well. While the omega-3 content may not be quite as abundant, it's still plentiful. You can also eat sardines, mackerel, and even tuna in order to acquire the health-giving properties of omega-3 fatty acids. The egg is also a protein source that's been much maligned over the years. But as a good source of protein, you'll find it extremely useful as you lose weight, basing your choices on the glycemic index. Don't be afraid to eat a couple of eggs once or twice a week. Flipping the switch, the benefits of low-fat dairy products. It's true. Just like red meat and eggs, dairy products in general have been considered off-limits for many dieters for many years. The high-fat content of several varieties of cheese and the natural-fat content of whole milk have steered many people hoping to lose weight far from the dairy aisle at the grocery store. The good news is that these foods fall, for the most part, on the low end of the glycemic index. And if eaten in moderation, any of these foods can help you lose weight. Keep it off and balance the release of glucose into your system as well. Milk, cheese, yogurt, buttermilk, and yes, ice cream. Believe it or not, these are some of the richest sources of calcium you can eat. You've just been waiting for a good excuse to open that Ben and Jerry's container now, haven't you? Calcium is vital for the proper functioning of our body. It's so vital, in fact, that if you don't receive enough of this nutrient through your diet, your body draws it from your bones. Over the years, this can lead to osteoporosis. To ensure you receive an adequate amount of calcium, you're advised by health officials to eat a minimum of two to three servings of dairy products every day. Make my dairy low fat. The key to dieting success is to choose low fat milk or fat free cheeses and yogurts. The fats in the dairy products aren't nearly as healthy as those you'll get from nuts. And if you're confused about just what a serving constitutes, it's defined as a cup of milk, one ounce of cheese, or eight ounces of yogurt. Milk comes in on the glycemic index with a low 27, no doubt due in part to its rich protein content. While whole milk also has an abundance of saturated fat, you can drink the low-fat or no-fat variety to avoid this. Yogurt, depending on the brand, flavor, and contents, ranks anywhere from a very desirable 19 to a respectable 50 on the GI. Any way you spoon it out, it's still a smart choice for the dieter. In fact, the low-fat variety of yogurt gives you the highest quantity of calcium with the fewest calories involved. If you just have to choose yogurt with fruit, the sweetening additives contribute to the higher GI ratings. And yes, even low-fat ice cream can be an occasional taste treat without making your glucose skyrocket out of sight. With the moderate rating between 37 and 41, you can feel decadently sinful without choking your blood with glucose and insulin. Making smart glycemic choices for breakfast. It's really not hard to make healthy, low GI food choices for breakfast. As you browse through the list of foods, and as you continue this eating pattern, you'll know by instinct what foods are low, you'll want to eat high fiber cereals, such as bran flakes, shredded wheat, or oatmeal. If bagels are your passion first thing in the morning, as they are for me, be sure to purchase the whole grain variety. Avoid eating the plain bagel. The same goes for English muffins. There's now a great hearty grain English muffin you may be able to find at your local grocery store. These contain nearly twice the fiber of a regular English muffin. Instead of buying that Danish pastry or stopping at Krispy Kreme donuts on your ride into work in the morning, even if that Krispy Kreme light is on and you can get a free donut, reach for a multi-grain muffin instead. And if you just must have that morning breakfast cereal that's a little further up on the GI, then consider sweetening it not with table sugar, but with some fruit. Berries are a good choice. The fructose found in berries is vastly sweeter than the taste and refined table sugar. The fructose found in berries is vastly sweeter than the taste of refined table sugar. One of the advantages of eating fruit, as we've already seen, is its natural ability to keep you fuller longer. You may be able to head off those mid-morning hunger pangs when you add some fruit to your cereal. You'll be amazed at how these small changes, which don't really feel as if you're sacrificing any flavor or enjoyment, can help you lose weight and provide you with more energy. Confused about breakfast cereals? No need to be. At first glance, it can make your head spin. Well, look at it. Kellogg's Frosted Flakes rate at a 55 in the glycemic index. While not low, it's well within the medium range, which should make them a good choice for an occasional breakfast indulgence. I hear they're great. Yet what many of us adults choose over those sugary flakes are the much more sensible corn flakes. But it turns out the glycemic index for this is 72. Go figure. And therein lies a lesson. Check out the entire index, at least scan it quickly, before you assume that certain foods are automatically the bad guys of the index. So what kind of cereals can you eat for breakfast and be sure you're not overloading your pancreas? Let's start with barley. You might not know this, but barley is one of the oldest cultivated cereals, and it's one of the most nutritious. But even beyond this, it possesses a high fiber content. But now you're well aware that high fiber equates with the low glycemic index ranking. For breakfast, buy barley flakes and rolled barley, which have a delightfully delicious nutty flavor. Wake up those taste buds in the morning, and these can easily be cooked into a cereal. 
By the way, barley, especially pearl barley, makes a wonderful ingredient in soups, stews, and even pilafs. Smart glycemic index choices for lunch. Instead of making sandwiches with refined white bread, choose multigrain and whole wheat breads instead. Search the grocery store in your area for breads and rolls that have plenty of fiber. Instead of eating a sandwich on two pieces of white bread, choose two slices of whole wheat bread instead. White bread has a glycemic index ranking of 70. If you'll recall, the index itself was created using white bread as a standard by which all foods were compared. White bread is refined, it's stripped of its fiber. Your body digests whole grain and whole wheat breads much slower, which means they have a much lower glycemic index. In fact, an average two slices of whole grain bread have a medium ranking on the index. Whole grain bread has a coarser texture and it will keep you feeling fuller for a lot longer period of time. In fact, don't be afraid to expand your culinary horizons when it comes to the various types of grains. Ever have brown rice? Its glycemic index ranking places it in the medium range, which means you can eat it occasionally. And it makes a great substitute for white rice, which has been refined, effectively giving it a higher and less desirable GI ranking. Other great substitutes for refined grains include the following, kasha, wild rice, bulgur, whole wheated tortillas. Whole wheat tortillas. Trying to add some whole grains even to your protein selection? Here's a great tip. Add cooked brown rice or whole grain breadcrumbs to your ground meat or poultry. Not only will this give the meat extra body, not only will this give the meat extra body, but it'll also provide you with some fiber to help you keep that satisfyingly full feeling longer. Learn to check the label. Indeed, the one vital habit you'll need to adopt as you progress in the glycemic index lifestyle involves reading. Reading the food labels, that is. The first item you want to check on the nutrition facts label is the fiber content. The more fiber a food has, the better indication it is that its glycemic index ranking is moderate to low. On average, you can equate a higher fiber content of the food with a greater amount of whole grain in the product. It only makes sense then that you'll want to choose foods whose labels assure that the product is made with the whole grain ingredients. In addition to the points we've already made, there were still several other ingredients to look for. The labels of food that aren't particularly low in the glycemic index may try to fool you. Multigrain sounds like it should be low in the glycemic index ranking, but this isn't always the case. Check out the fiber content on the food level before you purchase it. If a food is stone ground, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a good choice, either from a fiber aspect or its ranking on the glycemic index. Check out the types of sugars. That's right. After you're finished surveying the nutritional label, read the list of ingredients. Food manufacturers are quite adept these days in their attempts to hide the true amount of simple sugars in their foods. And as you'll readily recall, simple sugars break down quickly and are converted to energy rapidly. They may fill you up, but that's only a momentary fullness. Because the sugars are so easily digested, the energy you receive from these will be converted quickly, leaving you hungry quicker than you can say, pass me that Hershey bar. Examples of simple sugars you may find in the ingredients list of manufactured foods include sucrose, high fructose corn syrup, honey, and molasses. And here's a tip. Just because you found one of these sugars on the ingredients list, don't stop reading. Very often, manufacturers include two or more sugars in smaller amounts, so it appears that the food doesn't have as many simple carbohydrates. You can find all of these sugars we've just mentioned in an alleged healthy granola bar. You could be spiking your insulin levels unintentionally and even think you're eating healthy in the process. Flipping the switch for snacks. No, you don't have to give up snacks when you're eating according to the glycemic index. You just need to change your snacking habits some. Actually, you'll discover with a little imagination and some changes in habits, snacking with the glycemic index in mind is far easier than you'd ever imagine. The one change you'll need to make in your snacking habits is giving up those chips and other foods made with simple sugars and bad fats. But remember, there's a whole world out there. Just imagine, if you will, snacking on meat and cheese roll-ups, for example. This food is far more satisfying than the nutrient-deficient junk foods many of us normally eat. Roll up a thin slice of meat of your choice with a slice of cheese, and you can wrap these up in a lettuce leaf. Another satisfying snack is a cup of fruit, your favorite, of course, with a cup of tea. Think homemade snow cones. Ah, but not your usual ones. For this treat, you'll have to invest in one of those snow cone makers that you can find at a kitchen store, but it's oh so worth it. Normally, it's best to eat fruit rather than juice, but there are always exceptions. Fill the container of the snow cone maker about one-third full with an unsweetened juice. Top this with water and then freeze. Then, when you want a snow cone, just let your new kitchen appliance work its magic. Eggs. Ever thought about munching on eggs? Try a pickled egg. If you don't know anyone who can make a good pickled egg, you may have to visit a delicatessen to get these. You may also be able to find these eggs at some grocery store as well. 
You'd be surprised at how filling just one of these eggs is. If pickling an egg isn't your style, then try just a plain hard-boiled egg. You'd be smart to keep a few of these in the refrigerator at all times. Chocolate. Dark chocolate. When you're craving a snack, even a small square of chocolate can make you feel better. Take it from a confirmed chocoholic, but don't chew it. Allow the square to melt in your mouth. You'll feel as if you're really treating yourself. One of the great aspects of eating according to the glycemic index is the wide variety of foods you can eat as snacks. And nobody really looks weirdly at you. Well, most people at least. If you like tuna, then use this word as a snack. You can eat some tuna plain or even mix it with a small amount of mayonnaise. Nuts. What's your favorite nut? Go right ahead and have some. It makes little difference if they are pecans, almonds, hazelnuts, peanuts, or macadamia nuts. Check out the serving size on the package to see exactly how many you can have. Their low GI rating is no doubt due to the abundance of polyunsaturated and monounsaturated fats they contain. And when it comes to making you feeling fuller longer, they've got some tremendous lasting power. Nuts, by the way, are one of the richest sources of vitamin E. Combine this with their natural selenium content and you have a powerhouse of an antioxidant working in your favor. Selenium also has the ability to guard against harmful ultraviolet rays that may damage your skin. Don't think you can sit and eat a handful of nuts? Well, there are ways to get around that problem. You can just try using more nuts when you're preparing family meals. Toss some cashews in with that stir-fry meal, or sprinkle walnuts or pine nuts over a salad. But don't limit this creativity to just your entrees. Consider adding almond-containing granola to a fruity dessert. Think about using nuts in different forms as well. You can use a hazelnut spread on bread, or even substitute peanut butter for regular butter on your toast in the mornings. Here's a great hunger buster snack. One slice of high fiber whole wheat bread and peanut butter. If that doesn't satisfy that hunger pang, add an apple to it. Or for a late night snack, substitute an apple with peanut butter on top for those chips. For an occasional decadent snack, one your kids is sure to love, take that peanut butter, spread it on the apple, then top it off with just a smidgen of caramel dip. You can find this in your grocery store, and while it may be high on the glycemic index, you and your children are just eating enough to get the sweet taste. Don't want to eat them alone? Then mix these nuts with a few of your favorite kind of seeds and some dried fruits. Voila! You've got a great tasting homemade trail mix. Get imaginative, apple and peanut butter. And while we're speaking of nuts, why not try some kind of nut butter on a slice of fruit? Even a half a tablespoon of peanut butter, or if you're allergic to peanuts, almond butter, on a two ounce slice of apple or pear. The glycemic load of this snack is low. But wait, before we leave the topic of nuts, we've got to talk about the latest study. Let's just title this, Nuts and Weights Loss. Want to eat less at your next meal? Well, who doesn't? If you're trying to lose the extra pounds, you'll take that weight loss almost any way you can. Then simply eat a handful of nuts about a half hour before you eat dinner or lunch. The healthy fats of these foods, according to a recent study, releases a hormone called cholecystokinin, abbreviated CCK. This hormone, as we've discussed earlier, is released when the fat of the nuts connect with the wall of your small intestine. This event tells your body that you're not as hungry as you thought you were. And the beauty of this, the study found, is that you don't need to eat a lot. Merely 70 calories of a nut, of your choice, how much easier can this get, is all you need. If you choose walnuts, it would be about 6 of them, or 12 almonds. If you prefer peanuts, about 20 of these make 70 calories. Think avocado, and when you snack on this, you also are eating some good omega-3 fatty acids. Take one half of an avocado, cut it into cubes, toss this with some lime juice, salt, and then, if you'd like it spicy, sprinkle some chili powder over it. Or forget all the preparation involved in that, and just eat your avocado with a spoon, after you remove the pit, of course. If you like, fill that hole the pit was in with some salad dressing. Eating out, yes, it is possible. If you believe that your days of enjoying a dinner, lunch, or even breakfast at your favorite restaurant are now ending, you're in for a pleasant surprise. Even though you're eating from the constraints, which as you've seen aren't that confining, you'll find that you can find meals and combine foods to eat without sacrificing your diet goal. The first thing you'll notice as you pursue a restaurant menu is that the feature foods probably match those on the glycemic index. You have meats, fish, and poultry. These with their protein composition are easy enough to choose. Your only concern here is that they're prepared in a healthy manner. You want to avoid fried meats, fish, or poultry. You also want to choose the leanest meats possible. The healthiest way to eat your chicken out, by the way, is grilled. Choose boneless, skinless chicken whenever possible. Similarly, just about every meal in a restaurant includes a serving of vegetables. Before ordering, you may want to ask your server what type of veggie is being served, so you're not faced with cooked carrots with even higher entries in the glycemic index. And very often, you can even find fruit on the menu. 
This last choice is more prevalent for breakfast, but it may also be available at any meal. If you don't see it listed, it never hurts to ask. You'd be surprised how many foods you can actually order from a restaurant that are off-menu. See, the practice is so common that there's even a term for it, off-menu. Never be afraid to ask. But you'll probably find most of the time off-menu ordering isn't even necessary, especially if you decide to stick to the basics. Let's run through a basic dinner or lunch. Start with ordering your entree. While you may have to show some restraint, you certainly will find a variety of choices. Dining out is much easier than you can imagine. You may be surprised, too, at what you really can eat comfortably. Check out the salads, the protein entrees, and even sandwiches. Don't be afraid of those sandwiches. Specialty breads are becoming ever more popular. More restaurants, for example, are serving sourdough bread than ever before. And if you must order a meal and you feel one of the foods is a bit higher than what you'd like, make sure you have some good lean protein or some healthy fats. Set your dining out sights on the salads. Even with salads, though, there's a trick to eating out. Choose vinegar or a vinaigrette dressing, and I'm not talking just for taste or calorie's sake. Research shows that when you include vinegar in a meal, it actually blunts the glycemic response by 20 to 40 percent. Think about this the next time you order a salad with your meal. Just say no to the potato. Say no to the potato. While this is a no-brainer if it's french fries, it really is true no matter how the potato is prepared. You may want to choose cottage cheese instead. If you feel the meal that's being offered is too large, then perhaps your dining partner will share an entree with you. If not, then decide right at the start that you're not about to eat the entire meal. Ask for a takeout box first. Divide your meal in half and hide half of it in the box. The content of the box is the portion you're taking home with you. What's on your plate is the portion you're eating at the restaurant. If you just can't say no to dessert, then share one piece of something scrumptious with someone else. Also, remember to blunt the high spike in glucose that this dessert may cause by ordering a glass of low-fat milk with it. Ask for a takeout box for the dessert, too, and take it home with you to nibble on for days. You see, flipping that switch to make the glycemic index work for you really isn't all that difficult. In fact, in some ways, you'll even look forward to those changes. Let's face it, an eating pattern that allows you to indulge in low-fat ice cream every now and again actually sounds like something we can live with. Psychologically, at least, it's far better than being told we're never going to taste ice cream again. Talk about going through a mourning process. And when you add a wide variety of nuts to your meals and desserts, you'll discover that your taste buds are awakening to a whole new world of eating. A casual dessert suddenly transforms itself into a gourmet treat with just a sprinkling of some crunchy cashews or pecans. If you just have to have a taste of that ice cream, add some nuts to it. This way, you don't feel as if you've totally abandoned your new eating system, which indeed you haven't. Knowing the tricks to occasional indulging keeps that frustration level under control. Think back to past diets. The moment that ice cream touched your lips, you probably scolded yourself, but no more. You can have a taste of the ice cream and know that with some proteins and good fats added to it, you've not completely ruined your day. How cool is that? And these are only the tip of the iceberg. I've provided you with only a small fraction of the delicious changes you can add to your eating patterns. You won't even realize you're dieting when you learn how to flip that glycemic index switch to work with your body and not against it. Conclusion now you can pick up that knife and fork and begin to eat. That is if you've stocked your kitchen pantry and refrigerator with all the right foods. You should be feeling pretty confident right about now. Just look at you actually looking forward to starting a new weight loss management plan. And yes, perhaps that phrase is a mouthful, weight loss management plan. But you really can't call your soon to be new habit of eating according to the glycemic index a diet. But you really can't call your soon to be new habit of eating according to the glycemic index a diet. A diet, after all, implies that you change your eating habits for a short, predetermined period, only to return to old habits once you've lost the weight you want. And with the glycemic index, that's just not the case, because the index shows you an entirely new way of eating, a method of choosing foods that will serve your weight management and health needs for life. And that's exciting. Think of it. Finally, you can be able to get your weight under control, and at the same time, come to grips with the potential health problems that plague our nation. With just a little forethought, a little discipline, and a few simple changes in habits, you can begin to create a healthier you. Use the glycemic index to improve your odds against diabetes. It still isn't too late to change the direction of your health. If you start today, eating foods that have a low GI ranking, you can begin to redirect your body to function properly, like it did when you were younger. Think of it. Starting a new eating plan that not only may help you drop those stubborn pounds that refuse to leave your hips and waistline, and at the same time, gain peace of mind over some of the most troubling diseases around. And at the same time, gain peace of mind over some of the most troubling diseases around. 
It is perhaps the most revolutionary approach to eating that's ever been devised. By enjoying a wide range of foods and combining the proper categories of groups together, you can begin putting the brakes on your runaway insulin levels. The Glycemic Index Never Feel Hungry Again the glycemic index is a marvelous tool. It presents a weight management system that actually puts you in control of the foods you eat, the amount you eat, and exactly how and when you'd like to eat them. And when you don't feel deprived and have a and when you don't feel deprived and have a variety of good tasting foods from which to choose, you're much more likely to stay within the system. Imagine for a moment if you would being able to eat in moderation, of course, ice cream occasionally with confidence. And by mixing foods from the varying levels of the glycemic index and adding protein, healthy fats, and fiber, you can be sure that you are choosing the healthiest method of eating. If you're tired of dieting only to discover that when you stop, you gain what you've lost and more back, then you owe it to yourself to try eating accordingly to the glycemic index. Not only will you be surprised at how easily the pounds come off, but you'll be pleasantly surprised at how they stay off as well. Finally, yo-yo dieting can be a thing of the past. And when you eat for your health, you'll also be surprised at the amount of energy you'll have. Disclaimer. No information in this book is intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Nor does the publisher make any claims to the success of this weight loss system. Any weight loss program depends on several factors, including your ability to stay with the program itself, the amount of weight you wish to lose, and your desire to lose the weight, to name just a few. The book is intended to inform you of just one system of many that claim to help you lose weight in a healthy manner. Before you start any weight loss management system, you should consult with your personal care physician.